When will our cars get the kind of heads-up displays seen in science fiction films? Distance Technologies, founded by the team behind Vario VR, is taking mixed reality display technologies previously used in AR glasses and developing them for use in windshields. I met up with the company's co-founders to check out their prototypes and learn what it'll take to put holographic HUDs in the cars of the future. Let's check it out. Tell me about this display, which there's no name for yeah. at the moment, but uh, it, it looks like some type of glasses-free display. Yeah, I mean, this is world's first glasses-free mixed reality device. And we are pushing this one mainly to the automotive, aviation, and defense segments to turn any transparent surfaces in vehicles into portals to mixed reality. And one of the fundamental things is that we can control pixel depth, so we can draw for example, paint on top of the road, so that each and every pixel is at a different distance from uh, the, the windshield itself. Or, um, very importantly, we can also do it very wide field of view, transforming the whole windshield. And obviously we need to have something that we can lug around, so we have this kind of like a, I would say maybe half a windshield size thing with us right now, but it's massively different than what typical systems, for example, in head-up displays for the cars have been. Yeah. But this is like, this is true mixed reality, not just like a things floating in the air, but uh, like putting a headset on. I have a lot of questions. Obviously, when I first saw the device and I see an angular panel here with what looks like a display underneath, I'm thinking this is a combiner mm. and fundamentally similar to a birdbath optic system that I've seen in yeah. know, wearable glasses. So is that fundamentally the that kind of the optic system is that technology? A lot of similarities. I, I mean, if you want to be working in this kind of like a vehicles, you need to uh, touch the windshield itself as little as possible because it's a structural element. It's protecting people uh, and uh, and it gets broken every now and then. So it needs to be replaced. And hence, you need to create the image somewhere else and then have as little passive layers on the windshield as possible. So this is basically showcasing uh, replicating windshield mm -hmm. and then the projection unit in here. It's kind of perfect, the form factor of angled windshields and cars and the depth of dashboards makes sense, accommodates even the, this form factor, a scaled up version of those, yeah. those bird back optics. Yes. Um, but something you're doing different that's not in glasses is you're doing head tracking. Yeah. Um, so, I, as the demo I saw, you track my eyes, and so you're getting stereo correct, depth correct imagery in here for a single user then. Yes. Is that, is that yes. the idea? Yeah, and, and we can do it also for multi-user, but again, like as a startup, you need to focus, and we need to first perfect an image for one person, and then we can tackle on the challenge of multi-user uh, use cases. Uh, like fundamentally, there is nothing that prohibits it. It's just a step more difficult. It seems like there are a lot of options with these technologies. How many yeah. users you can track, how, uh, how bright the display is, and with if you're targeting a heads-up display in a car or uh, an airplane or all the places where heads-up displays today yeah. might make sense, uh, what are the, the targets that you need to achieve in terms of visibility, transparency, resolution, responsiveness yeah. to make this practical? I mean, I mean so many, infinite list almost. But if we start with the easiest for everybody to align with is in, in the cars, you need to have a really transparent windshield. And how these are spec'd out is that in Europe, for example, it's spec'd at 75% transparency for the windshield. You can have a little bit of tint in it, even throughout the windshield, but not too much. And, um, and that's one of the fundamentals. Then you need to be able to drive on real roads in real conditions mm -hmm. under that kind of transparency levels. So that uh, kind of pushes that the brightness of the system needs to be running at 10,000 nit. Like both iPads as well as then the laptops, they're, yeah. they're able to run at near 1,000 nits mm -hmm. in HDR mode, like locally. Sure. Not, not throughout the screen right now, but you can do it like locally at 1,000. So you need to go at least 10 times higher okay. than that kind of levels. Right, because you lose that as you go through yeah. the optic and, system. And, and, and then like from the optic system point of view, you need, you need to still double it because that 10,000 is the light, outgoing light from the windshield must be that kind of level. So, oh, where, so where the user sees that yes, must be 10,000. Exactly, yes. So the source must be yes. multiples uh, of that. Wow. Uh, yeah, not, not too much, but like a couple of times at yeah. least, mm. two, three. And, and good to remind, I mean, like distance is a 
150 days old company at the moment, so we're just getting started. And the most important thing that we have now kind of like proven that this can be achievable, that we kind of prove to ourselves and the world that the mixed reality, true mixed reality without a headset can be done now with this kind of surface. And, and thus, thus we are kind of happy to come here and show it at the Augmented World Expo as well. But, uh, but this was again like when we've been showing this to different car makers, for example Kia, that we visited, um, they simply never seen anything like this before and, and, and the interest is, is definitely there. And that's really fascinating to me. You know, as entrepreneurs, you guys are, are thinking about new technologies, thinking about productizing those technologies and the roadmap ahead, knowing the hardware and software challenges. Uh, you said, you know, a couple months into making your prototypes you've brought in here, you felt like there is a path forward. It is worth showing this to the world, building partnerships. You know, what gives you confidence in, in terms of where this needs to be that, that that can happen? I mean, of course, first first is seeing it working uh, with your own eyes. So so you start believing that it might actually be possible. Then the fundamental thing is that when you go to the customers and they tell that this is actually something that we are eagerly looking for. That's, uh, that's like a second fundamental trigger. And then of course, one of the things is that we always try to like learn what should we improve? Like is the resolution now at, at adequate level? Mm -hmm. We thought it, it, it was not, but most of the people that we've heard they have been saying, that, yeah, it, it, it's okay. Could be a bit better, but you know, not, not fundamentally uh, different. So iterations are always easy, then fundamental jumps are much more difficult. Um, but, uh, but there are great strides. The next biggest ones will be in the light engine. How do we create enough light into a system like this without breaking the uh, system itself? Because like light itself is detrimental for, for electronics. Uh, then uh, we don't break the bank. It doesn't become too expensive either. And, and then everything remains inherently safe in all conditions as well. So I got many things to like, um, design for. Mm. And the next step for obviously for us is to do a joint R&D project with automotive OEM or airplane maker, and then really start to kind of like install these in your cars and airplanes and, and really kind of like then together define like the final aspects of the products and so on. So naturally that's the next step for us. And, and that's why we're here as well, going to Augmented World Expo to meet, meet with the partners. In chatting with those potential partners, are you finding that they want not just you know, perspective correct and parallax for an, an enhanced visual experience for a driver or pilot, but also interactivity in terms of things like hand tracking or tracking of objects behind the glass mm. as well? I think, I think the biggest kind of like thing is that now for the first time we can take on the whole field of view, not the very minimal, like a postcard sized of it, like which is the state of the art currently. And the HUDs, they are very small. And the depth of plane is only one plane on the windshield or couple of meters behind the windshield. So now we have two things that we can crack. The full field of view and the infinite depth per pixel. And when we have shown those opportunities, now they imagine like really kind of like blows from the flat 2D into the true spatial 3D awareness. Mm -hmm. So so those discussions will be super interesting and inspiring in the, in the future as we engage into these kind of projects with the OEMs. And fundamentally that allows also more interaction to be moved from tablet centric into I suppose we could almost call it reality-centric design, so that uh, things become part of the perceived world in front of you. But fundamentally moving anything from the side of the tablet into in front will also be much more like inherently safer mm. because you're aware of things happening in front of you. Mm. The form factor you have, like I said, it accommodates the, the form factor we have cars today, of dashboards and windshields, but that's also changing as well as you know, we move into to EVs. And so how does this, I guess, scale and, and what ways can this be reshaped mm. but still maintain the experience you're going for? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that EVs are, of course, improving aerodynamics. So one of the first things is that you're like a decreasing the angle of the, uh, of the um, windshield itself. Yeah. And um, for example, here we're looking at roughly 45 degree angle and uh, most of even modern cars are shallower than that, maybe 40 degrees. And you start seeing EVs going from 30 degrees to even like like 25 degrees, that kind of like a, in, in Cybertruck, for example, which is like, 
mm -hmm. like this. Now, the beauty of this uh, system is that it scales incredibly well for that one. You can both put a bigger display because now the distance between the like edge of the windshield and the driver is actually increasing. So you have more room to play with in mm. systems like that. Okay. And, uh, and, and we have been testing this at various angles. So like fundamentally, there is no limitation as to the angle itself. So it, it does create like nuances in uh, reflective coatings and these kind of things. So yeah. like there is always like the devil is in the details, but uh, yeah. I saw in the press release that you're, you're calling this a display that works with any transparent display. And obviously this, this angle display here, this combiner, you know, is coded and it, it works in this bird bath system, but how can this system work on a, you know, a, a window that I have in my house? I, I mean, we have really interesting uh, patents filed on, on those topics. And unfortunately, we're working right now on this like a vehicle focused solution. And, and we're eager, eager to start working on, on that like any part, like absolutely any flat surface as well. But, um, but fundamentally, we focus right now on this one. Mm. And is the software challenge the things that you're iterating on that building a, a system that can then work with, you know, the different angles or different types of displays you're thinking forward that way is that the idea yeah yeah exactly so there is so much software work uh, as well to be done and and uh, we want to focus on something that actually brings us to the market relatively quickly uh, to an like an existing market in this case which is uh, always fun um, that uh, that that drives us to focus on that one right now and and the challenges i dare say are bigger for the like a fully flat Absolutely. surface. <laughs> the good thing, our, our team is exceptionally strong on software. We have background in operating system, embedded software, writing Vulkan backends for, for Unity and so on. So the team is, is really, really strong in not only in optics and, and hardware, but also software and embedded software. All right, well, good luck on iterating this. Can't wait to see this eventually some trickle down to a consumer space or a, a mm. car even. Um, mm. And thank you so much for sharing. It's great to see you both. Hey, thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much, Norm. Okay, so I just got back from my demo with distance technologies. I want to spend some time relaying what that experience was like, because it's exactly the kind of visual technology and optic technology that's so hard to convey with a flat, video that we're filming, especially since it's tailored to me sitting there being head tracked and eye tracked. But fundamentally, what they're going for is the kind of heads up display in a vehicle, a car, an airplane that you'd see in science fiction. Remember at the end of Mission Impossible 4, where Tom Cruise gets into the BMW and he needs navigation and the whole HUD lights up with navigation and all these interactive elements. You've seen that in movies and Star Trek, all sorts of science fiction shows. They want to make that possibility not only in the cars that we might see that you might you and I might be able to buy in the future but more practically in maybe uh, aerospace military all sorts of places that they can get the funding right now to pursue this technology and in practice it well I think it kind of works it definitely is a solid proof of concept and one of the things that made me uh, reminded me of is way back in 2007, there was a researcher named Johnny Chung Lee, and he made this incredibly viral video where he hacked a Wiimote so that it could do head tracking. He had the Wiimote move alongside his head in front of a TV screen, and with the perspective of a tracked object or uh, perspective, it would, he would be able to show objects in that flat screen appear as if they were popping out or receding into the screen itself. Obviously, that wasn't 3D and it was shot through a standard YouTube video, uh, but it was extremely powerful because everyone gets it. You want to be able to sit in front of some type of display and be able to move around and have virtual objects without glasses seem like they're popping out at you or have some sense of depth. This felt like the logical extension of that. Same idea. Your head is tracked here, your eyes are tracked as well. And as Maya was moving my head around, the birdbath optic system would actually in stereo 3D, translate my perspective of what I should be seeing relative to the virtual object so I would get true parallax, true depth. And so this virtual landscape that they're created, this virtual visualization could be placed in an infinite distance with lines coming out from it. I could move closer to it up to about half a meter from the display itself and it would look right. The convergence that my eyes made to that virtual object would look 
as if it was there, which is extremely important when you're talking about using this in any type of heads up system, like in a car, where you need to have the virtual objects. It would be ideal to have them actually match up if you're gonna do it in 3D with the real world things, because you don't wanna have your attention split between driving and then also focusing and trying to reaccommodating your eyes for a virtual object. Now, clear limitations of this so far, because they were using off-the-shelf parts. The head tracking was a little bit wonky. If I moved my hand up to do the hand tracking, it would lose stereo tracking and it would kind of fuzz out. I would have a little bit of stereo overlap issue. So I, I can imagine some calibration maybe needed in the future that you could do. And obviously, as they talked about, they need to make this extremely bright, extremely sharp and readable. And also it needs to work with a, a windshield where you can still see at least 75% of the real world. The demo we were using in this dark room, you could only see about 25% of the real world. And that's why they had this done in dark room. So they would accentuate the brightness of the virtual images. Now, I'm not sure if they're gonna be able to achieve all those milestones and goals. But one thing that was interesting was how comfortable it was just to be able to look at these virtual objects without having to wear any type of glasses, without any calibration at all. And even though the resolution was kind of low, I could see vertical interlacing. I didn't, don't think I need to really read text when I'm using a HUD like this. Like if I'm driving a car, I kind of just want, you know, visualizations that give me telemetry info, maybe directions, big arrows, and can track and recognize an object in front of me. And they had a demo where a person walking in front of the screen, the windshield they had there, would be virtually tracked. That was really cool. So, and I think they have also, partnered with the right people. They've gone to auto manufacturers. They've gone to places where there could be a lot of money to be made and spent on this type of R&D and not trying to create a whole platform and selling directly to consumers yet. This, that's, I'm actually really glad they're not trying to do that because that would make this seem much more like vaporware. So I'm really curious where this company goes. They're only 150 days old. Uh, they seem to be confident in their software stack and where they think the hardware can take them. Um, and with their past uh, pedigree starting up Vario, uh, I have a lot of confidence that at least they have sound engineers working on this uh, and a good sense of where they could be going. But if you have thoughts of what a heads up display of the future could or should look like, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Norm from Tested and I'll see you next time. Bye.